Okay, hello everybody and welcome to day two of the Ujiria Dojo. Uh, yesterday uh, you spent, uh, tried lots of different mechanisms for um, running the, um, the open, um, the, sorry, the Ujiria OMAG server platform. Uh, today we're going to look at uh, changing um, code and uh, content in the Ujiria project. So um, David is going to start with a view of the open source philosophy uh, that uh, we try to practice. Uh, then we're going to have a, a look at some of the different tools that we use as contributors. Then you're going to make a change to Ageria, and we'll, we'll, I'll demo it, but we'll go through step by step, um, talking about what's happening um, as you work with the um, with, with Git and GitHub. Um, I'll then want to talk a little bit about the types of contributions that um, you can make and, uh, and, and, and the sort of skills that you need in order to work on those. Um, and then finally, we have a session on becoming a contributor. So that's uh, day two. Okay, over to you, David. Hello, um, welcome to day two. Um, this is just a kickoff to, to do a quick sort of overview, of sort of slightly my take on what the open source philosophy is. Um, we've had quite an interesting time over the last two, three years um, as we got involved with open source, first with Apache, the Apache Atlas, and then we've been involved with the Linux Foundation and ODPI in Nigeria. So I just thought I'd go back to basics and say, what is open source? And this is the Wikipedia definition. And what, what strikes me is that it sort of starts off in um, software terms, but it seems to have expanded to cover more of a way of doing things cover open content, like it says, and, and it talks about collaboration as a sort of way of doing things. So I think it, it sort of moved out of IT and it's become bigger than just IT, which I thought was interesting. And this is what people have said about open source, so I'll let you have a look. I won't read them all, but um, this is the sort of uh, what some of the people in the industry have, have said about open source. And the one on the bottom left is quite interesting. Once open source gets good enough, competing with it will be insane. Thought was a, a quite a, potentially a contentious statement. But, but it's interesting who said it as well. Sorry, David. It's interesting who said it as well. Exactly. So. exactly. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so um, I'll just. Uh, so just to what I thought the key sort of points of these things is it's all about the people. Um, it's about innovation and it's about empowerment. It's talking about small groups of people, um, a flat open uh, groups of, um, of organizations uh, rather than potentially traditional ways of producing IT. So as you approach open source, there is, um, you need to be aware that there is uh, ways of doing things and you don't, uh, so you want to ensure that you're legal. Um, what IBM has is a mandatory open source participation um, guidelines education, which we do every year, just to ensure that people understand how you contribute, what the implications of contributing are, what the risks of contributing are, and um, so that we can go ahead and, um, and in, get involved in open source in a healthy way. So, I just sort of um, pull out the Apache license two, the Apache two license here. There's a, a sort of plain English website that sort of breaks down what these various licenses means in, in ways that I can understand because often I, I get um, lost in all of the, the legalese around it. But so this is a, a website that allows that sort of breaks down some of these um, uh, the, the licenses to things I can. I can understand some some basic uh, some terms. Apache license, um, Apache two license is the one that Ageria the uses. So for IBM is on the call, this is the link to use to um, access the IBM open source um, education. If your company hasn't got a sort of education, I think it's a useful thing to do to set up to, so we know that everybody's aware of their responsibilities in this space because we don't want them getting into trouble or you getting into trouble. And what that's likely, uh, why you might get into trouble <laughs> would be if you don't 
um, honor the licenses um, in, a, in a decent way. So Wikipedia has this list of um, a table. And I thought this was quite an interesting way of um, thinking about the, of displaying the licenses. It seems that there are, in the open source world, um, you've got a choice of two, really. There's an open permissive license, in which case you can write it in, in the open, but you have got the opportunity to package it into a product and then sell it on. Or you've got more restrictive viral copy left orientated licenses, which, which doesn't allow for prioritization. So it means you can't wrap it up and resell it. So they seem to be the two that are mostly can, that we're mostly concerned with when we're thinking about either adopting open source or what, what our open source should be licensed with. From an IBM point of view, where we're looking to um, use software, which is this open permissive style of license. I, I put the other ones there as well, because I think they're quite interesting. Um, we have obviously IBM has proprietary licenses when it sells its software and services. So I just, this is uh, my sort of very simple view about how an organization might um, be working uh, when it's not using open source. So potentially it's hierarchical, um, uh, messages are going up and down the pyramid. Um, we could have offering managers and it's uh, the people on the bottom row will be the person, people doing the coding and the like. As opposed to open source um, communities where which come from many different organizations and um, so organizations, different, whole different fields like researchers, students. Um, and then we also have on the right, we have the installable software and we have um, the code that is also visible because that's open in the open source case. You can see that the important thing in the, in the lower case, the open source place is that we have a community that is very diverse. Um, some of the consumers might be in the community. Some of them might be in organizations. So this was my sort of simplistic way of thinking about um, potentially two styles of um, software communities. But of course, it's not quite that simple. I think there's organizations are now realizing there's benefits um, to having uh, uh, adopting a, a community approach in part. And I think there's, um, there are obviously organizations have vested interests when they get involved with the community. They're, do, they're doing it for a reason. So it's not quite as clear cut as I said, but I think it's quite an interesting way of uh, sort of slicing how the how organization uh, of the community or organization of your IT workforce can can um, look can look different in the open source way. So that's the next thing was um, I was just thinking about what successful open source project look like. Um, so most people when you when you sort of Google around this, it's they're talking about a healthy, diverse, active community. They're talking about re resolutions of issues, um, different viewpoints in the community. They seem to be fair and respectful. The Apache way, um, as Mandy mentioned, we, we really enjoyed that um, talk by Alan Gates from Hortonworks, which is, which is now um, Cloudera, where they went through their, their way of engaging and how you deal with these various, um, if, if people don't play by the rules of open source and community, how, um, what, how, what is acceptable, what isn't acceptable. Um, so that was really interesting. I think a good measure as well is when was the last commit date? If, if that was over a year ago, it's probably not that vibrant a community. And if we have turnaround on issues and PRs, that's a really good sign that um, somebody is interested in proving this stuff enhancing it and fixing the bugs. Of course, healthy adoption will always help the people who are actually using it. So um, be it by itself or in, in amongst other software. So then the question sort of comes up, if it's free and open, um, is it worthless? So I what I was thinking about here is that it, it comes along with a central sort of question to how you uh, and what your uh, vision for your organization want, wants to be. And how do you view yourself? What do you put worth on? And I think um, 
in, in the open source world, it's that we're putting worth on community and we're putting uh, worth on self -empower, uh, empowering developers and other contributors and honoring good collaboration. Um, so, I mean, and why would you do it yourself when you're potentially got a limited number of people, limited funding, when potentially you can either pick up high quality community created offerings or contribute and create what you want with other people, getting a, a more rounded view of the, of the problem that you're trying to solve from these different perspectives. So then there's the sort of question about, yes, that's all very well, but how do you actually make money? And I think it's also, it, it's one of those things about where is your value add from a vendor point of view? Um, if you only do community things and don't sell anything, you'll probably go out of business. So you need to get a way of funding yourself and, pretend, and making profit. It's where you want to do the value add is the important thing. So some self-reflection on working out where your, your goals are would be what I, what I was thinking around that. From a consumer point of view, um, there is there's different ways you can, um, different approaches. You can be very passive and just take advantage of the good work that the communities have done and effectively um, take on these open source distributions because of the, the high quality that they've proved to have attained. Um, or, or you can become much more active. You can influence and effectively talk about developers owning the products, these projects. So I think um, if you really want to um, influence the direction and, um, and get involved, then the idea is that you don't just you don't just stay as a computer as a consumer, but you become a contributor, a maintainer. You get involved in the community, um, and that and that sort of uh, that sort of thing. So I think it's was that where do you want to be on that active on that axis between active and less active? So open source means a new way of thinking about worth. I, that was the way I was thinking about it. So some thoughts about the value add. Um, you can, and this is where you find the worth for things. So maybe including open source libraries within your um, proprietary product. That's one way to consume open source. Another way would be that you add enterprise enhancements. Um, that So you take uh, the base product and you make it scalable or disaster recovery, or you get, add extra security or um, that sort of robustness um, transaction throughput that's optimized for performance or, or that sort of thing. Um, another way can be that you add proprietary connectors to, to your um, software. So your software might not have been written with the open APIs in mind, but that doesn't matter. You can still be part of an open ecosystem by writing uh, connectors, those proprietary connectors that, that map your proprietary APIs into open APIs. And an example of this would be a database connector for Ageria or a repository connector. So you can plug in things that aren't open source um, and have proprietary licenses into an open source ecosystem. Another way that we, even though yesterday we, we saw that um, we have some UIs that have been developed, we expect that, um, and we're aware that there are groups around that are going to produce tooling and UIs around um, Ageria, Ageria. So uh, what would be, and I think to create a, um, a bespoke um, experience to make, um, is something that that's where you can create your value add, create these new pieces of tooling are based around um, an open source project. Um, I'm using Ageria as the example, or UIs around that open source project, or dashboards, or however we're, um, however you want to actually ex um, drive. It, it's a new user-focused um, way of driving the open source capability, and the, when the capability may not have um, too much tooling or UIs uh, at that moment. A simple way to do it would just be is to skill up on a, an open source project and then rebundle so you can support it. So you, because there is this thing in the open source that um, if you raise a defect, um, it doesn't just get fixed. Like um, if you bought a, um, 
a product from a vendor. So IBM is very proud of its uh, service record, for example, and we have turnaround times for defects. That wouldn't be the case in an open source um, community um, because um, you raise a defect, you'd be, but they almost there is the obligation that you're going to be the one that fixes it, or you influence somebody else to fix it, or you're part of the community and the community realizes this is a defect that they want to fix. So it's a slightly different way of thinking about support. And I don't think these are um, restriction, res uh, restrictive um, options. I think there's going to be many ways for us to envisage how open source works with other open source integrations, with proprietary licensed offerings um, in many which ways to enhance um, uh, cognitive and AI, which we had mentioned earlier, for example, to be able to, um, uh, so there's lots of ways we can, um, we can work with open source to create the, the, the value add. And what do developers need to do different when they're working on open source? So there is this sort of two hats idea um, that Alan Gates talked about, that your one hat is you're um, part of the, um, the organization you work for and paying your salary, potentially, um, in the organization case. And the other hat is that you're actually being respectful about your um, part of the open source community <clears throat> to make sure that you do the right thing by the community and you sort of you sort of have to be careful that you don't compromise either of those hats. <laughs> so I think what a good um, community member is, is somebody who is active. So they share reflections, they might make videos, they might make code contributions, it might be um, documentation or testing enhancements. I put developer as king or queen of, or queen or king of open source and code speaks, there's definitely, you hear that a lot around open source, but we are keen that other contributions are recognized. Um, we talked yesterday, the end of yesterday, it's about trying to recognize advocacy, for example, um, and aiming for a win-win. Um, there is this sort of idea that if you have a, a proprietary piece of software, potentially, if you have two ways of doing it, you probably just do the one that you decided on the one that was maybe easiest or the one that worked for you best. But what we found in open source is what we tend to do is just if two, two parts of the community want to do something, they both do it. And we have um, some way that they can both coexist, maybe a switch, a runtime switch, or maybe they're pluggable components. So Ageria has the connector framework to allow you to plug in many different ways to, to do, um, for example, messaging, and we don't have to use Kafka if somebody wanted to write um, one for a, a non-Kafka uh, messaging uh, events piece of software, then they could write um, connectors for that. The other thing that can be a bit scary is that all contributions are visible. And it's almost exactly the opposite from where we came from 10 years ago, where you wrote a line of code, hardly anybody saw it. Um, with it so it was very much a private affair. <laughs> but uh, really, uh, now it's you, you have to be um, come out of that of, of the private room and every piece of code that I've written, for example, and the mistakes that I've made are all visible in the GitHub um, history. So it can seem a bit scary initially, but I think it's worth it. And everybody's in the same boat. And the, as you share your um, the bugs and, and what's happen, happening, the more you share, the more you realize that people um, are fixing them and things get fixed quicker because there's not, a, um, there's not that sort of organizational structure um, that potentially that, that stops it from happening. So you're likely going to feel, I, I seem to get this um, impression that in the open source world, people see, feel ownership and pride for the community and the projects that they work on. If they've been coerced to work in there, that might not be the case, but Overwhelmingly, I get the impression people are smiling when they talk about open source. When we, when we went to the Apache conference, um, we, people just seem to be brimming with enthusiasm about the open source. And, and I think that's just to do with the nature of the community. And I think it's almost a, um, a gamification that has happened by having these tiers of um, committers and contributors 
and steering groups. Um, there's a hierarchy to sort of work up the way up, and it gives you an orientation and something to, to work for and somewhere to aim for. So I think that's all very positive. So as I sort of mentioned, if you want to change something, um, you need to be actively either convincing someone to do it, um, coding it yourself, um, and as, as the more that you contribute and the more that you've influenced, um, if you want a change to be made, the more that you're um, going to be recognized in the community as somebody who's contributing well. And um, so that's, that's sort of the sort of get active. It's, a, it's, a, there, it's rather than potentially hide, hiding away but, and only coding and nobody sees your code hardly apart from the one person that reviews it in a proprietary software world, it's a much more open and active um, world and, and visible. So I did mention the <laughs> advocacy thing where, as Susan sort of touched on yesterday, where, um, so you may end up, because you've had, you've got engaged in this community, you're working with it, you like the way it works, you want to spread what you like. So um, you may end up sharing your enthusiasm, sharing what's good, what needs to improve. Um, and often um, organizations may not be bought into um, taking on open source. And I think there's a bit of a journey to often go through. In the same way, taking on um, governance and the like, we find that we, we need to um, talk to people, talk them through the journey around governance. The same with adopting open source. We need, there's a, a journey to be taken, um, and that involves um, developers and contributors uh, are definitely seen to be the people who can influence um, how these decisions get made and whether open source gets adopted. So we're talking about, I think uh, we're talking about culture change uh, from moving from a all proprietary to adopting open source where appropriate. And IBM's obviously gone down this route um, in a big way with its um, with it, with our involvement with Red Hat. You may end up presenting, blogging, um, giving education, um, social media um, <laughs> tweets, and the like. So my final thought was: I wondered if Algeria was a metaphor for open source communities. I mean, the, Mandy's pictures looks very much like sets of communities all communicating, or communicating, communicating. No top-down central control, peer-to-peer -peer collaboration, <clears throat> embraces and honors diverse technology and contributions, and open agreed guidelines um, about the way that you do things to ensure that everything stays healthy. And to um, so, so that was that was my thought around how uh, bringing it back to Algeria at the end of it all. Any thoughts?